Okay. Um, all right, so far so good. I think we've had some good discussion. Of course, that's driven by the great speakers we have. And now we have another great participant. Uh, honored to have him here. Uh, Bruce Wingus, or is it just Wingus? Wingus. Wingus, that's what I thought. Bruce Wingus, who is the vice president and editor of the Akron Beacon Journal. Um, and we talked already. Uh, Bruce just came in, so he didn't, he didn't hear all this about you know, digitization. We talked about music. We talked about um, books and libraries. And what is more fundamental now than newspapers to our democracy? We talked about how many of us like to read our New York Times or Cleveland Plain Dealer, our Akron Beacon Journal. And you know, we need um, high quality reporting. Somebody's got to be on. And I want to talk to you about some of this, so, some of what's keeping you up at night. And, and uh, are we still getting high quality reporting? Are we still getting news even? A lot of times as fragmented as it is because we've, uh, we've talked about music fragmented. So please welcome Bruce. And um, come here, Bruce, please. Good morning. So we prefer, I prefer to be up here because it just seems like we're closer to you and when we get in a question and answer, it's better, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Makes me feel so tall. So <laughs> I just do it to myself. Okay, but um, we're gonna, uh, so if you could be in front of the mic because I'm terrible about getting uh, away from it. First thing I would ask you is, the thing I notice is Plain Dealer, and this is not a knock on the Plain Dealer, I read my, my hometown paper, I also read the Akron Beacon Journal, I read as many papers as I have time for, but it cut delivery on a couple of days. I noticed you guys have not done that yet. Um, why is it? Have you, did you think about it? You know, do you have revenue loss uh, the way other papers do? Are you challenged? Go ahead. My gosh, you ask a few yeah, questions well, there. Um, ahead, <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, first of all, every, every news organization, I think, across the country has gone through some revenue losses. Um, it's important to, um, when we're trying to go through this thing to realize, at least for me as an editor, one of the things I really like about this is that our content model is not broken. People want to consume the local news that they can only get from us. The business model is a whole other thing. Um, and that's what keeps me up at night on some level, on many levels, because without the revenue, you don't have the reporters and the editors that you need to produce that local content. So we're all going through that change as um, we try to figure out where we can chase the dollars to support the journalism that we want to all keep. Um, as far as the plain dealer, that was, that was their decision. It's not a decision that I would make. I'm not sure there's any right answers to where we're going to go. That's something that Advanced Publications has done, uh, not only in Cleveland, but New Orleans, Portland, Oregon, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Um, they own the paper in, um, shoot, Newark, New Jersey. Have I got that right, Glenn? Yeah. Um, in Staten Island. <clears throat> yeah. And so that's their answer to this, and, and they believe that um, they can uh, support the journalism through a combination of moving away from the print in a very aggressive manner and then um, going online in an even more aggressive manner. Um, that's, like I said, that's not a decision that, that um, we've made at the Beacon Journal and, and uh, we believe that people still want that uh, newspaper seven days a week. It's also important to remember in all of this and all this, you know, you've got audience growth in online. That's where our audience is, is getting much larger. That's where people are picking us up. And you've got circulation loss in the print product. And so how do you balance those two out when still 90% of our revenue comes from the print? That's, that's where the money is. That's where the advertising works for the advertisers as opposed to online. So it's a very difficult uh, uh, place we find ourselves and, and we just keep trying to produce uh, the best journalism and local uh, content that we can and stuff that you can't get anyplace else. You're not gonna get what you get from us or the plain deal or anybody uh, from a blogger or somebody else who's not going to go through public records, who's not going to uh, sit through trials, who's not going to try to um, hold public officials accountable. So Did I answer enough of them there? Yes, thank you. <laughs> so the loss of revenue, is it, um, is it, is it driven by classified revenue? Is yes. that, can you explain how the, what's happened there? Yeah, I, I don't think advertisers, although I'm, I'm an editor here, so keep that in mind. <clears throat> I don't think advertisers have figured out what works for them really online. The one thing that does work is classified. And if you look at a newspaper uh, 15 years ago, typically 60% of a newspaper's revenue came from classified advertising. Along came Craigslist, 
Newspapers reacted very badly to that, and now you have much smaller classified sections, so a lot of it is, is there. Um, a lot of other advertisers have found other ways to try to reach, um, to reach their customers, but at the end, I think they're still trying to figure out on some of these things um, how, how to get the customers into their stores, whether it's through online or through a fragmentation of online and TV and, and, and newspapers and magazines or what. So, uh, Glenn was telling us that, um, and, and I was aware of this, they put up a, a paywall yes. at Newsday. Now, you haven't done that yet, have you? No, we haven't done that yet. Um, what, uh, what we thought as a newspaper industry, and, and actually um, um, Susan, shoot, I've forgotten Susan's last name, former editor of the Plain Dealer. I knew, the, anyway. No, no, not Susan. Shoot, this is going to drive me nuts for the next half hour. Um, <laughs> Um, anyway, she always said we wanted a, a take back on, on, that, on that deal we made in the 90s where we thought that the advertising revenue could support the online like it did in the print. It didn't work out like that. And so um, you've got um, a lot of newspapers that are putting up a paywall. It adds revenue. Uh, the New York Times for the last year, for the first time with its paywall, their revenue surpassed <coughs> the revenue from subscriptions surpassed the revenue from online advertising by several million dollars. And so that speaks again to the value of the content that they produce and another organization such as us producing. And so we're definitely looking at a paywall. Um, I'm thinking we should because you know you give something away for free and it devalues your content. Uh, you, you give it away for free and, and when somebody calls me on the phone and they say, why should I buy the Beacon Journal when I can go to Ohio.com and read all your stories for free? And I don't have a good answer right now, mm -hmm. other than the fact we're trying to grow the audience and we've grown that audience. And so, you know what, maybe they should pay too. All right, and, and, and you know, what we've heard uh, in the first part of the program was a lot about content. You're talking about content too. Uh, Patty talked about it, Erica talked about it, Glenn talked about it. Um, Let's talk about news content and what's happened in the world of social media and parasitic journalism and, you know, when, when people are going to TMZ or to Fox News and, and I'm not getting into any political, uh, I'm, not, I'm not disparaging Fox or MSNBC, but, um, you know, what are your, it's, it seems like the news has become so fragmented and it's so fundamental that we at least get the real story and form our own opinions. It's fundamental to our democracy, and, and, and do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, one of the thing, one of the other things that keeps me up at night on some some levels is, and it'll happen again in, in this fall. It'll happen big time in 2016. Is is that we are so fragmented in our media landscape that you can go out and find somebody that agrees with your political views and think that is the news, and you'll consume that, and you'll think that's the way the world is. And then you have this really jarring thing when you realize, and this isn't right or left or anything like that, this is just political landscape, you get this jarring sense of reality when the world doesn't turn out like all the commentators have been telling you it's going to. And so you lose an election or something else happens that doesn't fit, fit your worldview. And then you call me and you get really angry. And so I get these calls that are just, just patently absurd. Um, I was telling Mark the other day, um, during the 2012 elections, we ran a picture, even did this with Obama on the left and Romney on the right. The pictures were the identical same size. Their heads in the pictures were the same size, so one head wasn't bigger. They both had their arms raised up like this, okay? And I get a call from someone who says, I have a bias because I made the president look angelic. And then I have another bias because I made the um, governor of Massachusetts, the challenger, look like he was uttering a curse word in my selection of those photographs. You know, I got better things to do than think about that. I, I've got a good imagination. It ain't that good. Uh, I just can't dream this stuff up. And that's, that's the kind of thing that you deal with. I mean, it's just goofy out there. And, and it gets goofier as the national political season comes in closer. And it's interesting because the local politics, you know, local politicians have to work together to get things done. They got to do that. You don't get the streets cleared. You don't get the potholes filled if everybody doesn't agree that you got to do that. That doesn't hold out on the national stage. And so the national stuff hits me locally. And, you know, I care more about how we're going to cover Cuyahoga Falls than the size of Obama's head or Romney's head. 
So I was talking with Ken last night, and he, in, in along the lines of this question, even um, taking this further, there's almost targeted news now with Facebook. And, yeah. Uh, and Bill Maher was ranting about this uh, one night, uh, you know, bemoaning it, saying, you know, I want, I want the news. I don't want, you know, I don't want you to filter the news based on my preferences, the way you yeah. filter my ads. Yeah, and and there's that that's that's the, that again. If you if you really want to be informed, you need to seek diverse opinions. If you want to have your opinions backed up, then go to an echo chamber, mm -hmm. and, and and you'll feel great about that until that dose of reality hits. And and uh, it was interesting to watch Fox News um, on election night in 2012 because if you saw that. And this is just, like I said, this is not right or left. This is an interesting political meltdown they had when reality hit. And, and you saw the commentators and, and, and you saw that the Republicans were not going to win that election. And, and they just said, well, this can't be. And it's because a lot of the folks in there were believing what they were saying or what they were hearing. And it's really bad for any party to believe that because, again, you're not, you're not getting a doses of reality there. You're getting an echo chamber. And at some point, that's going to make you deaf. So uh, we've not mentioned Steve Jobs in the seminar yet, uh, but I just did, and we're gonna we're gonna talk a bit about. I'd like to talk about the fact that you know we talked about the music industry and the challenges it faced, and we were talking about online. And Steve Jobs came along and had a vision, and it was the right time, and he was able to broker a deal with the major content providers and create this Apple iTunes user experience. I'm not saying he solved the music industry, but uh, I think it's fair to say that um, he, he figured out some portion of it, at least for some time. Mm -hmm. And now we read that Jeff Bezos has bought the Washington Post. And w what are, are you, is the industry sort of looking, are there conferences where Bezos might speak? Are they looking to him as a Steve Jobs-like guru mm -hmm. who with his retailing expertise may figure out how to monetize news again? Um, I think we're all looking at him for that because we're all looking for a savior. Um, whether he is that person or not, I do not know. I'm not that smart. Um, but we're going to be watching him. I think he will bring some fresh ideas to an, an older industry. I think if you look at the, um, the Graham family, which owned the Washington Post for years and years and years, actually bought it uh, on a bankruptcy sale, I believe, in the, in the 30s or the 40s, bought it for a very cheap price. Um, they were just tired of it, and, and I think some fresh ideas will help us. Um, so we're always looking toward that. Um, as far as whether he's going to be the answer, I do not know. If I did that, I'd be a consultant and make a lot of money, I guess. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> How about some questions from the audience? Anybody, anybody have any questions thus far? Yes, yes. ma'am. Um, it's, it's interesting, when you look at, uh, the question you also ask gets to something called citizen journalism. I think that um, those kinds of images work well for breaking news for something where you don't have somebody there. I think that you have to go through the right ways to do that, and one of the things that we really respect, and since I'm speaking to a bunch of lawyers, I can say this, is who owns the images. Mm -hmm. um, we go after people who violate our copyright, and we are very respectful of other folks' copyright. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that that will give us more information, but will they replace photojournalists? I don't think so, because there, there are skills that go into that that you just don't get with your, with your iPhone or somebody who hasn't done this for a long time. Trash shooting LeBron James or Kyrie Irving, since we're in Cleveland, um, when he is at the height right before he falls, um, and you know, shooting that in a millionth of a second, those are the kinds of talents that you need for photojournalism. Try spending the time with the subject where you're spending an hour with them to try to get some really emotional photographs or an emotional interview, and those things take time. But I think it can help, and I think we ought to include that, but I don't think it replaces uh, the journalism that we produce now. So, but that's a great question, because how has your life changed? And I'm, I'm gonna ask Glenn this as well. In the last five years, because of social media, both both, you know, parasitic journalism, people who are ripping off your stories that I you I like made. that parasitic journalism. Uh, I haven't heard that before. That's a, that's a good... I don't think I made that up. Um, <laughs> thank you. So, uh, but it, your stories appear on Twitter or something like yeah. that. Or, and how, are, how have the lives of your reporters changed? Um, you know, um, we used to listen to a police radio. 
okay? And that, that's the squawk box that sits in a newsroom and, and you, you hear all these police frequencies. We used to have city directories, and if you don't know what that is, I'll, I'll tell you later. Um, we used to use typewriters and things like that too. On the one hand, we have a lot more reporting tools than we used to have. We have in our newsroom, and we're not unusual like this, we have a page that we've set up just for the newsroom that follows all these Twitter feeds from other news organizations and from other people in Akron where we think they all, they'll see something before we will. That's our police radio today. Um, we, we leverage our presence on social media so that our Cavs writer has 17,000 Twitter followers right now. And we're using that to bring people to our content that we produce and we're also watching social media to see what else is out there and you know if you're a reporter you used to sit there and say okay i'm going to write a story about whatever potholes can you and i'll go out and find people who have have um, had their cars damaged by potholes this can take some time now i can put on my uh, facebook page hey has your car been damaged by potholes call me or send me an email mm -hmm. And, and that made my reporting job easier and more efficient. So we're trying to leverage it in that way. And, and also it's just, a, just other ways to look at the world. On the downside, uh, sometimes social media and Twitter and these other folks uh, tend to take our content and use it in ways that uh, we do not see uh, fit. And then I'm, I'm, I'm either writing, making a phone call, writing a letter or calling a lawyer to, um, to rectify that situation. Okay. Glenn, how, how's your life changed in the last five years because of uh, social yeah, media? Reporter. Well, it's part of uh, <clears throat> you, you have to kind of serve your audience in whatever way they're looking to be served. So I was at the Kanye West concert last weekend, his, his final show of his tour. I had, to, I had to tweet. I had to write the review while the concert was going on. And then I had to write another review um, after it was done to kind of wrap up the thing. When I, when I worked at the Beacon um, 10 years, 15 years ago, I would write one story that would run probably two days later yeah. because of the way deadlines work. I've written three things before midnight of the show that ended at 11. And before it appeared in the paper. Right. Yeah, and, and that, that's a good point. You know, you cover a trial, you're gonna write something at noon during the break, you're gonna write something right afterward, and you're gonna write a complete wrap-up story for the paper the next day. That's Questions? Yes. As far as the regional paper like yours who just report on international news, and how do you see that changing in the next five years? Um, you know, we don't do much anymore. Um, and, and, there's a, and the reason for that is there's so much national and international news available through other, other forms. If you look back 15, 20 years ago, there wasn't a CNN, there really wasn't an internet. And so why should I spend Beacon Journal resources on that when I can focus locally on the content that, that differentiates us and that you can't get anyplace else. And so on the one hand, I hear from some, some readers who are very frustrated that we don't put the Ukraine as much on the front page, let's just say. Uh, but by the same token, right now my perfect front page has four local stories on it. Um, because that's what we do that nobody else does we have the largest newsroom in Summit County. Plain Dealer has the largest newsroom in Cuyahoga County. Um, and so that's what we hang our hat on. Uh, by the same token, you know, if there's something very large going on, and, and the Olympics were something, we had the opening and closing ceremonies for that on our front page. But, you know, when I, when I get up at seven in the morning and watch CNN, I feel really great when they're talking about a story that we um, had in the paper this morning. I feel really bad when they're talking about a national story um, yesterday that we had in the paper today. And that's, that's, that's what we face with that. But our, our franchise is local news. And so we need to, if we're gonna be around, we need to, to leverage that as best we can. Question? I'm not sure if my question to the speaker or Mark or one of the other panel members, but you, Everybody. you take your content and put it on the web, and along with your, your stories go the images that you place with those stories. How do they not become part of the public domain and available to be reused by the reader, particularly if the reader has paid to walk through the wall that you talked about before? Because we own the copyright. Because when the reader buys our paper or visits our website, there's a copyright agreement on the terms of service there. 
um, and it says this is for your private use only. It's, it's funny, there's lawyers out there, and we're running across these if we misuse a copyright, who are going after people who violate photograph copyrights. And you can have a photograph, apparently, if, and you all are lawyers, you know this stuff better mm -hmm. than I do. Uh, if you violate a copyright, even they can have the copyright in the metadata of the photo, it can't even be posted on there, and you can still get sued over that. Uh, but that is for, that content is for the use of our audience, and if you, um, take one of our photos or take some of our content and use it in a way without our permission, we will come after you. I'll, I'll, let, me, let me bear with me one go story ahead, here. Um, there's, a, there's a coalition of the eight largest newspapers in Ohio and we exchange content um, on a regular basis. And we came across a website um, in Ohio that was taking our content wholeheartedly and putting it on their website, getting hits on it, getting advertising, our pictures and everything. They were boasting that um, that you can come here and the conversation's a little milder with the comments and everything because these people, you know, they were, they were treating content with respect, but they were taking content from all eight of our papers. And so we, we saw this because, it's, you know, a lot of reporters will search on their names and stuff and find out where their stories are being uh, uh, shown. And so we wrote them a joint letter and said, you're violating copyright, you take it down now or we will sue you right now. And they had about 12,000 stories from our papers, and they spent Labor Day weekend taking them all down because they got the idea that we were indeed serious because we would have sued them, and we would have won. They were violating copyright. And you know the funny thing about that? They had a copyright notice on the front of their web page. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they probably copied your terms and conditions, too. They, they didn't do that because they didn't say Ohio.com, but they, I thought, my gosh, come on, you guys. So, yeah, so copyright attaches the moment something's fixed in a tangible medium of expression, whether you register or not. And I doubt that you register all your works. Uh, uh, you we, have, we have a blanket registration or something. Uh, I, every I three months you do this kind yeah, of, yeah, okay. Yeah, or every year or so something. That means I give they, money to somebody to keep it copyrighted. Yeah. <laughs> so you would... Uh, they would even get statutory damages if the works were registered. And, and indeed, uh, Bruce is right. Those are protected by copyright law. You have a license. You have permission, anybody does, to, to look at a website and, you know, consume that content. But, um, you know, the surprising thing is you, you, if, if your daughter gets married and, um, you, and she has wedding pictures taken and she pays $1,000 to the photographer to take her wedding pictures, I mean, she gets a book, she gets to pick what picture she wants. You know, but technically, the photographer owns the copyright in that yeah. picture. He took the picture. He never assigned it over to your daughter. It didn't create his work for hire. And so therefore, if she would take that picture and use it in a book, he might say, that's my copyright. You can't or do that. Newspaper. But, or a newspaper. Yeah, exactly. You, you experience. Right enough to insist on getting the images as well. Well, yeah, you could. If you, if you didn't pay the person yet, you could say, oh, I'll give you a thousand bucks, but I want you to sign over the right title and interest to me, and I don't see why they wouldn't, actually. I believe there's a concept in law, you know what lawyers, I believe there's a concept that um, when, uh, as far as an artistic thing like a photograph, when you create it, you've copyrighted it. Do I have that right or not? Well, it's, it's fixed then, if it's fixed in a tangible medium of expression. So as soon as it's sort of fixed on a computer disc or uh -huh. then, um, or in film or something like that, then, then you own the copyright yeah. as a matter of federal law. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So do you, how, I mean, so somebody sends in a story and they, you know, here's a picture of my yard, look how it's snowing today. Mm -hmm. um, and you, and you put, do you, how, how do you vet that? Do you? Do um, a lot of times we'll, we'll, if somebody sends in a, a picture, we'll um, call the person to say, we want to use this and, and, and try to go through those, those steps. Every now and then I have somebody in the newsroom who wants to take something and, and, um, post it on his or her Facebook page and, and, and I have to remind them if you did not, if you just can't right click and take something off of that because mm -hmm. the, there, there are lawyers out there and I sent them a case um, where uh, they'll come after you if you violated that copyright and, and they realize that the deeper the pockets, the, um, the, more, the more money they're gonna get. So they're looking for publisher, publishing companies, not individuals who violate copyright. And so, you know, it's, in, in the culture that we have today, it's, it's very easy to right click on something or, or cut and paste something and just put it in an email or whatever. And when we're publishing things, I gotta remind the newsroom, no, you can't do that unless you have permission from the, from the person. Okay. And who's got a question? Yes. Yeah, can I take, first of all, I was blocking them, I'll stop, and that's what you're not using alpha.com. Cut and paste it, put it onto a blog. Cited it to seeking alpha. That's not a copyright. No, there, there is, there's, there's fair use, 
Um, and, and I think I should get a law degree out of this thing. You might. Uh, <laughs> you might. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there, there's fair use where you can take a headline and, and a paragraph and then go back to the source, and, and, and that, that, that would be fair use. But if you take, as I was describing the other website, if you take our whole story and put it on your website and sell advertising against it, and, and we find out we're, we're going to take a very I mean, fair use is pretty complicated analysis. It's, it's four factors, but... You know, one of the factors, to be sure, is how much did you use, but it's still quite analysis. I mean, it may or may not be a fair use, because uh, we don't know exactly what you did or what. Yeah. Yeah. Two paragraphs, I posted, I took the page from one paragraph and put it over, it said picking out people, picking out jobs, picking out. But you were reminded of another problem, which is, I think it's a problem for you, maybe it isn't. Um, so somebody doesn't really cut and paste your exact article, but you've done all this good reporting, and maybe it doesn't happen as much to you as it happens in the New York Times, I don't know. But, but then you have these other fragmented websites who take like a story you wrote and say, oh, that's a good story, they did all the reporting, did all the work, I'm just gonna change words around, you know, create a little bit of a different expression, mm -hmm. and now put my byline on it and, and put it out there. How many of you watch TV? Watch TV news, local news? Read your paper and see how much TV news follows local news. They do that all the time. And, and they do fresh reporting, which gets them out of the, the quandary that you're talking about. But again, I've got more reporters than any radio station or TV station in Akron. And so they're going to look at the stuff that we do. And sometimes they're going to freshen up and move the story forward. Other times, they'll just take the same story and report it two days later as something fresh and, and, and change it around a little bit. But that's, that's, that's how that's gone forever and, and with the... Um, with the um, internet, it's, it's more and, and that's not copyright infringement because the facts are not subject to copyright protection. Yeah. Uh, if you have a different expression, truly, and that could be an argument whether you have a different expression. But, and we won't talk about this today, but there's something called the hot news doctrine, too, that, that might apply. Just, just uh, saying. Any, any, yes? I was going to say, but what you described originally is just taking a story from the New York Times, re rewording it, that probably would be copyright infringement because if you're just basically moving the words around and you're basing it your entirely on that without the fresh reporting, that probably would still be copyright infringement. I don't know that it would, or it really is. I mean, I, and Professor Kuka could maybe comment too. Uh, I mean, if, if the sentence was, you know, I, uh, the, the terrorists fell to their death from the ninth floor and the sky, cloud was, sky was cloudy, and then you said under a cloudy sky, you know, terrorists leap to their death. I mean, I don't know that that's copyright infringement, you know? Well, part of the problem is it's facts. It's, it's, yeah, it's facts. Yeah, the, the, but, they know, did fall. Right, Justice Holmes talked about that. Uh, you know, you could, copyright is going to go after the things that are small. So making small changes doesn't exempt you from copyright. Yes. Next question? Yes. Uh, what advice would you give to someone assuming they want to major in journalism? Uh, go ahead and do it. We need good storytellers. That, that's my advice. And, and one of the things that does not change through all this, the same as with the music industry, I gave a speech to journalists who had gotten scholarships um, and, and was trying to give them some encouraging <laughs> words, is that the need for the content does not change. The way we present the content may change. Um, how much you get paid to do that may change. But if you really have a passion for this, if you have a passion for watchdog journalism, for storytelling, for feature writing, for reviews, for covering sports teams, Go ahead and do it. It's not, not the easiest life, and it never has been. You don't get weekends off. Um, you don't get snow days, um, you know, and those kinds of things. But um, if you want to do it, go ahead and do it. But realize also there's a lot of opportunities out there. And, and all this hasn't changed the need for the content. And if you want to go into public relations, it hasn't changed the need for, you know what, at the end of the day, if you're going to be a, a public relations professional, you're going to keep your client from putting his or her foot in your mouth. And, and that hasn't changed. The need for the stories hasn't changed. So, so far, what we've heard from all our speakers is, and, and, and I didn't really expect this motif to sort of emerge, but it's really content is still driving. And, and I guess that's a good thing, I think, that amidst all this experience is, if you're a novelist or you're a musician or you're a writer, you know, we'd all like to believe we can, to some extent, control our own fate. And if you're really that gifted, uh, I think you can believe you can emerge. We'll take one more question and we're right on time. Two back there. Two? Okay. In view of the Sun Times and its star from last May, mm -hmm. would you tell somebody to go to journalism school or would you stay here there like Elliot Erwin said? 
Um, I would tell them not to work for the Sun-Times, but beyond that, um, I would tell them to go to journalism school. I would tell them to, to learn the craft. And the Sun-Times, I think, is regretting that decision because they need the visual content, and so they're paying for it still. Um, it's just not, not like it was. And not, not a lot of other media have followed that, uh, that model. Yeah, he, you know, he, he wants, to, wants to reach a different audience, and so he's, he's doing that. Um, realize that what we put on Ohio.com is the same content we're putting in the Beacon Journal, by and large, although it it's, can be more breaking news and stuff like that. And so it gets to the, uh, the question of a paywall as far as the value of that journalism um, and, uh, and whether people are willing to pay for it. And, and, and we're finding out when you look at the New York Times and other and Newsday uh, that people are willing to pay for it. Because uh, what, what we found in our research, anyway, is that um, when, um, when you put up a paywall on a news website, your hits go way down um, for a while, maybe six months, and then they start coming back because people realize two things. A, you were serious about it, and you're not going to change your mind, and B, they want to read about the police stories or the music reviews or whatever you're doing, and they're not going to get it anyplace else, and now they're going to have to pay for it. You got another question back there. All right, where are you? You find that now that the New York Times kind of leads the left and the Wall Street Journal which kind of leads the right, have put a paywall that they don't take that much pleasure in anymore? Does it work? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I, I, I honestly do not know the answer to that question um, because people can still cut and paste if they're paying a you know if they're paying a subscription fee too. So I, I don't know the answer to that. I have one, one more question, and then we got to move to our next segment. Um, it's really not related to our seminar, but I, I just I'm interested in maybe you can't or, or will not, or but I'm interested in your view if you can. What is your view on regionalism in this area? And um, I mean, I certainly think there's room for two major papers here, mm -hmm. and uh, I missed the. The press a long time ago. Yeah. Um, but what is your view on you know regionalism as it as that term has come to be known? Be, be known. I think this area has to cooperate. I think that when when people think of regionalism, they don't really people in Cleveland. Let's just say, and I'll say this because I'm an editor in Akron, don't realize that Akron has its own identity, and Akron, you know, th there's there's strong personalities in in all of this, and we all need to cooperate to move the whole region forward. But you can't just put the whole thing under one umbrella without realizing all the diverse um, parts of it. I think that made sense the way I mm -hmm. said it. Uh, and so you got to take that into consideration when you talk about regionalism, that, um, that, that you still have some very strong players between Akron and if you want to throw Youngstown mm -hmm. in, and then even the suburbs of Cleveland, east and west, you have some very, very strong players in there who uh, want to do things. And in the end, we all benefit economically when we move forward. Uh, but that can be a difficult thing to bring those folks together. I want to thank you very much for coming. I know you're busy. I would, uh, and you're invited to stay, and, and you may participate if you stay as well. Right now, I'd like to invite Glenn and Patty and Erica up here. And if you could bring your cards, I'd appreciate it. And I think it will be more. Uh, <laughs> what's that? Oh, you've got name cards. OK. Thank you very much. All right. And uh, Professor Kuhn now will. Uh, Settling and let me personally thank everyone for coming here. As an advisor to Jolby, you know, it's always wonderful that we can get.
high quality participants to come here to case, uh, but also to participate in our academic journals as well. Uh, I'd like to thank Mark, though, if you, if you look at my iPad, uh, as, as we were going through the morning, uh, I had to keep changing what I was going to ask and I was going to say as the, the conversation developed, which is wonderful in the end. Uh, I'm not going to talk very much, right? So what's fascinating is 20, essentially 20 years later, for those of us who first started worrying about the digital dilemma, uh, you know, where are we now? Uh, and so I'm going to want to focus just on two points since Mark took so much. One is the steam of content is king. Most of us know that people don't want to buy something if it's not high quality. And we have in this room uh, five different representatives from four different industries, right? four different means of generating content. So the first I want to ask, you know, how do you do it? What are the incentive structures that you see today uh, that may have been different than 20 years ago? And kind of where do you see the incentives coming uh, in the future? Can I go for it? <laughs> sure. So perhaps a little bit different than some of the other panelists who, uh, who we've heard from, uh, Overdrive at its core is a distributor. So we're not necessarily the content creator, but we do have relationships with thousands of content providers. And publishing, book publishing in particular, is a traditional slow-moving industry. So the way that we got them to participate in the digital landscape is to get them comfortable with compensation methods that they were used to and use models that they were used to. So in the case of libraries, that means the way that most content is accessed by end users is on a one title, one user basis. So if a library buys five copies of an ebook, for example, then five end users could check it out at the same time. Publishers were on board with that because that's the way that physical libraries and a lot of other um, you know, industries work that they were that they were already making their content available to. So that was kind of the the starting point. Once they saw that there was money to be made in this market and that these were consumers, and that as somebody mentioned uh, or one of the questions that just because a end user may not be paying for it, of course the library is is paying for it, and they're at the end of the day getting a check um, for that sale and that those people who are checking materials out from the library are avid readers, they're consumers, they also visit bookstores and, and other places to, to buy media. So we started with a model they were used to. We have since expanded to additional use models and compensation models, more of subscription or, or an annual fee, and the, some are in and some are out. So having a marketplace where both content providers can feel comfortable and like they're they're getting you know their money's worth for participating, but also offering flexibility to end users because as we've heard, people want it you know in the way they want it when they want it, and so we're in the middle, kind of walking that fine line to still attract the best content, but also you know give at the the most flexible access to the communities we service. Okay. Um, sure. Um, so American Greetings is is a little bit of a you know a little bit different from a consumer product standpoint because as a consumer products company we offer forty thousand to sixty thousand products at retail every day. So we're creating things for forty to sixty thousand <laughs> products. Um, in the digital environment, it then it just expands. And in the past, we used to have two different creative teams working on product lines for retail um, and product lines for our digital distribution. Um, in recent years, we've been able to find better synergies uh, so that we can take the product at retail, translate it so that it appeals to the digital consumer. And for American Greetings, what's 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 easy is that we do have a product that that. Um, that that people feel sentimental about, and so we are we do follow the model of best in class. So we are always looking for best in class content to and, and listening to the consumer. We do a lot of focus group research and a lot of development. It took us two years to put out that Just Wink product um, to understand the digital com the digital community and, and make it more robust. But we've been playing in the digital space for 
for, for a long number of years. And, and social media fits so well with the type of product that we have that the synergies are there. Um, and I think for, for American Greetings, our, our incentive is just to continue on that best in class acquisition of content to put out what we feel that our consumers are, are driving need for. It's engagement, it's creating loyalties. We've had a subscription model on the digital side for a really long time. And what we found out on the subscription model is that people just allow their subscriptions to renew. They don't, they don't send cards, but their, res, their subscriptions will just renew year after year. And that's not necessarily a sustainable model for the pickier consumer, the Gen Y consumer who wants really good stuff, um, and they want to get it whenever they want it, wherever they want it. Um, and so we've, we, we've taken a hard look at that model and, and looked at loyalty and engagement um, in just with a fresh way. So. Well, and Patty, you say 60,000 <laughs> Yeah, at retail. Yeah. Uh, at retail. So crazy. Uh, how do you generate that content? Is it you know, in-house? Do you have freelancers? Or is it a combination? And have you seen that combination? Oh, um, certainly. We have at American Greetings over 600 creative um, staff members, writers and editors and graphic designers, animators. We have our own production studio, so we create our own music in-house. Um, and so we do generate a lot of, of, of content uh, and we have a network of freelancers from around the world to fit certain needs depending on what the trend is, depending on what um, is the next new thing and how we need to speak to the consumer. We're looking for that content all over. So it is, it's a, a balance, but they're getting smarter. <laughs> the content providers are just getting more savvy about what they what they want to license, and so they're carving out markets and making us work for presenting things on social media. So, for example, we're negotiating a, a deal right now with 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 one of the um, major networks, and a condition of the agreement is an internet use policy and guidelines for placing content online. So. We may be able to create paper cards, but how can we speak to the consumer if we can't post about it, blog about it, put it on social media, and then create content for our online, our online services? So we're negotiating another piece and exceptions to their policy so that we can do what we want online, but they're getting smarter about telling us, no, you can't put that online unless you have attribution, unless you, right? And our consumers don't want to see a big notice of who owns what piece of what piece of what we're doing. Well, I think as a journalist, um, the incentive remains the same as it always has. You want to find stuff out first, and then you want to tell people about it. And I, th I don't think that's changed at all. As a content provider, which is a term that didn't exist 20 years ago, we, we really have learned that people's um, thirst for information is unquenchable. Um, <laughs> People want to know as much as, they want to know everything right now. And we have to work differently to kind of give them as much as we can ethically and like that we know for sure as fast as we can do it. And I think speed is the thing that, that has changed uh, with the internet. Well, and do you feel a pressure for, you know, your, your incentives, right? Your economic incentives, more than just, you know, your passion is to deliver facts and deliver the news. I mean, we've known for some time that having professional journalists is one of the greatest threats to the news industry, that, that the, the, to the extent that the business model is being challenged, it's paying for high quality reporters as opposed to people who can comment and express opinion or going to Twitter feeds and other right. things like that. I, I, I mean, um, being a good journalist takes a lot of work. It, it's like what um, Ken was talking about earlier. Uh, there are many, you, you can be a citizen journalist pretty easily now. There are no, the barriers to entry for you to write your story, put it on the internet, get people to see it, theoretically, is, is gone. To get people to keep coming back to believe what you say and to make sure that they trust what you're, what you're telling them that's something that you have to build and you have to be really good at your job in order to get that. And uh, you have, it takes a certain amount of skill and it takes a certain amount of um, 
salary to keep someone who's kind of that smart and that skilled at a specific thing in your industry as opposed to going to, to do something else? Going to law school. Law school, <laughs> um, public okay, relations. I, I was very comforted to hear Bruce say how you know, he still recommends that people go to journalism. Uh, slightly sw different switch, and then we'll open it up to questions, and, and that is licensing, right? So the kind of anti-Chris Anderson approach that's existed for quite some time is the idea that technology and the internet, uh, we shouldn't worry about the property stuff, right? Let, let people keep copyrights and let it be even longer because licensing could be easier, right? That it would be much easier to reach out to people who create content and get the deal so you can use it. We've seen the creation of the Creative Commons. Uh, we've seen the creation of you know, the copyright licensing networks. Uh, so what, what do you all think? I, I mean, especially Erica, as, as a distributor who has to deal with so many content providers, or Patty, uh, as someone who has to juggle all these licensing issues, <laughs> has it gotten easier, or has the problem only kind of exponentially gotten worse? I, I, I always think of you know, what Mark said, you know, Girl Talk. He doesn't sell his music. Uh, because he's afraid of being sued. Or those of you who know the story, WKRP, uh, the television show. You don't see that uh, on DVDs in part because of licensing clearing uh, with a lot of the music that we suggest. The ability to engage with particularly book publishers to sell their digital content, ebook and audiobook, let's say, has gotten easier because their contracts with their authors have accounted for these rights. So, you know, 20 years ago, this wasn't, this wasn't a discussion that was being had. So the conversation was, oh, I got to go back and check my contract to see if I even have these permissions to do a deal with you overdrive. Thankfully, we've gotten over that hurdle in most cases for taking the entire work and making it available through a distributor like overdrive. Now, when you talk about chunking the content, individual chapters, or just X segment of it, that's a whole nother conversation. I don't know if I can do that. Combining eBooks and other media, eBooks and audiobooks. Again, I gotta go check my contract. If I hear that, that's like, I don't wanna go there because you know, there's a lot of time and effort for them they have to realize what the opportunity is at the end of the day for them to go down that road and check their contract or ask, ask inside or outside counsel. So as I said that publishing in general is a, book publishing is a traditional industry, the pushing the boundaries to mashups or new, even new business models, it's, it's a slow go. Um, but there are publishers and self-publishers and others who aren't the, the random houses and Harper Collins of the world that are more willing to experiment and they do, they do feel like they have the rights or they're digital only publishers who their print agreements, you know, it's, it's a non-issue um, because they're born digital content. So in some, in some aspects for a straight distribution relationship with Overdrive on more of a traditional model, I'll call it, it's gotten easier, but you know, we're always trying to innovate and push the boundaries and respond to consumer demand. And so it's a, it's a conversation, but we're, we're headed in the right direction with the advent of subscription offerings and streaming in the video side for Overdrive and some other ways to access the material and even combination of, of media. So it's getting easier. But do, do you see the increased problems as you try to go more global and, and enter different markets? Yes. Um, we, we are servicing customers around the world and navigating the landscape of licensing globally is a big task, so we take a focused effort to, um, you know, the markets that we have a uh, existing customer base. But um, one of our newer forays is into doing business in China, and there, um, with Mark and his firm's help, we've been learning about the rules and regulations of bringing digital content into China, especially as a non-Chinese headquartered company. And some of those include getting things like import licenses for digital content, which to me, those two don't compute because it's bits. But in any case, um, so some of these things that 
may feel like holdovers from physical distribution and shipping and things like that still exist in some international markets. And in China, of course, there is another level of um, sensitivity around the subject matter of the content that's brought into the country. So that's a item by item review of all the digital material that Overdrive wants to sell in the market through service providers that we're, we work with that are essentially part of part of the government. So this is a whole area where, you know, frankly, without good outside advice, you know, this isn't part of my usual sphere of things that I, I'm thinking about is it, individual review of page by page of the ebook title before I can make a sale to my intended customer. So the law students take notes. <laughs> Patty. Um, so we have fewer pieces of licensed content um, on the digital side of the business because the distribution that we have in mass really drives licensors to come to us and say, put my you know, content on your cart and distribute it at Target and Walmart and sell the greeting card for between, you know, three to five dollars and give me a royalty on that versus potentially free digital content or digital content that's just not the cost basis is a little bit different. So I think that as the retail environment shrinks because there people are buying fewer greeting cards, the hopefully the digital licensing on some of those big licensors will will likely expand so that they can put their content out there. Um, digitization for American Greetings, um, the global issue for us is a, is, a, is a big issue because we have subsidiaries in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, and, and, and where it comes into play is because we're, we're trying to be digital internally as well as not just digital offerings to consumers, but uploading content and making it just easier, just more available. And so, what our artists and writers and, 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 and creative staff get counseled on every year from an education perspective is IP law and don't right click, don't cut and paste. But then, but today we have a, a, a digital library for them to look at. And the digital content may have come from a third party that we put into a database internally. And so their digital footprint out on the internet may not be as readily available to us to, to counsel them about, but they might think that, that that content is not without license because it's in this global database that is a company we globally use. Um, and then when they look at the rights managed piece, they're like, oh, it's licensed. Well, no, it's rights managed. There's no model release. Okay, I could use it maybe in the UK, but can I use it here? What are the rights? And so to train creative folks on, on that content and having that just a digital global database of content um, has been, it's challenging. And, and along with that are, you know, data, privacy issues that, that we face along with that. Jump in here as the individual journalist. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I think that we really do need to come up with a way for licensing to work out and for copyright to work out. De La Soul uh, put out one of the one of the best hip hop albums ever called um, Three Feet High and Rising. And when they did it, there weren't clearances. They didn't go through any of that. But because of that, the album's been out of print, and they can't. Re, they can't release it to digital outlets because there's all sorts of rights that they never got. So what they're doing is on, on Valentine's Day, they made it free. for They just put it out for all their fans to grab as, for one day because there's no way to put it out legally. We need to figure out, yeah. there's money that could be made for everyone. Why not figure out a way to give them give everyone the money? But because them and girl talk, because it's easier to not do it legally, uh, because it's too complex, it, 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 no one makes any money. Or because the people that want the licenses are demanding too much. Well, there's that too. <laughs> yeah. All right, at this point, I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience. Yeah, there used to be some pressure. I don't know if it's still Um, that would be a question for Mark. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, theoretically, we have something like that for public, public performance. 
can't be my feedback, and it works very well. Um, <clears throat> to the problem is, as I see it, and I invite your comments, is that you know, we have something for mechanical licenses too, which is to embody a musical composition in a record. That's pretty easy to do. You just go through Jerry Fox, and as long as the piece, like we all wanted to participate right now and do a version of Yesterday by the Beatles. You know, uh, one of us on our laptop in, before the session is done could purchase a license for 2,500 copies. We can all sing, I'll record it on my iPhone, I'll put it up and uh, email to each of you one, it'll be entirely legal. And we can do that. But to do mashups, to do um, music and, and make greeting cards in movies, something like that is beyond what a compulsory license will permit, a mechanical license. And we, and we have to do a synchronization license. And then, just presenting the content owner's argument, the content owner doesn't know, maybe it's a pornography film. Maybe, you know, they don't want their music in a pornography film. Maybe it's, some, you know, maybe it's a content owner that has a particular political point of view and doesn't want American Greetings using content in what it perceives as a greeting card that, you know, doesn't espouse the idea. So right now it's like one on one. But having said that, I totally agree with you. <laughs> and um, we should have lunch. <laughs> and, and I don't know if you you know Peter Rinell, I believe. Yes. And and I talked to Peter about this, and um, you know he's invited me actually to, to be on a little committee with him. Uh, he's he's really sort of on a mission to uh, get a mashup kind of license that that works. You know, so it it isn't so difficult. So in certain areas that are covered by copyright, Congress has stepped in right, and, and said, at a minimum, there's the statutory licensing of fees. So if you go ahead and do these things, and in a certain way, uh, that's all you have to pay. Right? So that speeds up the negotiation process. In, in others, right, you have voluntary groups that have been created to essentially help facilitate that. Right? Uh, but the difficulty is they're voluntary. And, and so my, my, you know, I may not want to join uh, the copyright claim. I may not want to work with the Fox uh, group, but you know, it may be to my benefit, but I may choose not to. Right? I, I could be a filmmaker and want the license to Netflix, or not. I, I, and so that's part of the copyright process as well. Uh, Mark earlier talked about the idea of licensing uh, music uh, and creating in, you know, a, uh, a mandatory license for you know, distribution of music. You know, so I'll, I'll say I was one of the first people <laughs> to argue for that uh, globally as well as nationally. When the internet came around. So there are lots of ways to do it. We, we really haven't explored all of them yet. Any other questions? Yes. My question is for Derek Bass. Yes. What is the financial incentive in limiting the number of users that can download an ebook? Because like, I don't go on to Tidal or Tony's website, and it'll say, you have to wait. And then like two months later, it'll say, okay, now you can download it. I just don't really understand why. Like, I mean, there's really not like a limited number of those, correct? I mean, I don't, I just wonder why you have to wait to get an e-book sometimes. And it seems like it would just be there. Sure. So at least two reasons. One is what I alluded to before, that um, the compensation, compensation model for publishers is one that they're familiar with and one that exists already in the physical world. So they get paid for each unit that is sold to the library. The second is library budgets. Libraries have budgets that are not ever expanding and they make collection decisions so they decide what copies and how many and what titles are available through the Cuyahoga County Library. So the trend is that more of their budgets are going towards digital materials and less towards physical and keeping things on the shelf but they have a set amount usually on an annual cycle and although they are interested in meeting customer demand and not having a wait list that's 150 people long, that's, there's still the reality that they have a pot of money that they have to divide up among their various services. So getting the publishers to play in the space and then also just accounting for the reality of library budgets are kind of two reasons that that's the way it is, even in digital form. Jobs to convince people to put their music on iTunes. It took Jeff Bezos a lot to convince people to put his uh, books uh, on 
Amazon. So again, you have to deal with the people that want to give you the content and kind of respond to their kind of needs. Other questions? Uh, yeah, this is from Patty. Uh, you were talking about the, the growth and demand for digital content as far as like digital greeting cards and that kind of thing. Do you ever see that really ever surpassing like the physical cards sold in the retail market, or do you think that's always going to be something that's more traditional? You think of you know you want to have a card as opposed to something that's like three years. Well, I think this probably goes back to what Mark wanted to point out with Kodak. You know, is the greeting card is it a dying industry? Um, it certainly has shrunk quite a bit. Um, but I, I think that if we continue to, to, to do um, the strategies that we have, I think we can keep it going. I think it will continue to shrink. I, d I don't think digital will surpass, only in the sense that I think that people still want a keepsake, um, and I think that they still want those physical connections. Um, but I, but I think it has to do a lot with education of a younger consumer and what they, in responding to what they need. Um, I do think that you know our Gen Y consumers, they do still send paper greeting cards to their grandmothers and their mothers and their, you know, I, and so I think if we can keep the tradition <laughs> alive and the conversation alive, but I, I, I think we worry about that all the time. So, which is why we're, we're, we've brought the digital business much more under the fold of corporate. We always thought we were just going to spin it off and sell it off. Really, that was, the, that was what we were doing with our digital business. It, it operated like a, a mini Apple. There were ping pong tables, different culture. They were just, they were siloed. They did their own thing, had their own artists, own content, own time schedules. Um, and now they're, they're sort of getting forced into this corporate culture and it's it's been a little bit of a rub but I but I don't see anywhere else for us to go if we don't link the two together um, we we will be we will be out so but that's the money makers those paper cards so <laughs> we gotta keep it alive I don't know if you know the answer to this but how much competition do you see not just from e-card but from you know the individual's ability to make their own physical cards right they can go to iPhoto or one of these shops or they can go to Shutterfly yeah. And now all of a sudden, they, you know, they have hundreds of cards that they can yeah. get on the holiday. Yeah, yeah. Um, so c competitively, the, the landscape for us isn't those sort of one-off creative little folks out there. Um, it's, it's the shutterflies, right, where personalization and the technology they have around personalization, because people want to put photos on things. Um, so in that space, it's extremely competitive for American Greetings. Um, and so we're, you know, we're always looking for new ways um, to acquire different technologies. Um, but at the end of the day, <sighs> Those the smaller houses just they sell very little, and our distribution channels are we we have the largest online greeting card presence um, in the world, and we offer varying models and testing varying models every day. So some from free con free free content, which is not the best in class content, um, to um, to subscription based, to pay on you know per use, to to pay to print. So testing those varying models on in the digital space to try and remain competitive. I'd probably ask my business client what she thought <laughs> <laughs> and why they were. Um, um, I, I really don't know how to answer that question. From a greeting card perspective in the model, I mean, we, we're we testing different models of distribution because I think we're just trying to find the right fit for the, for the market. Um, I don't think there's any one right fit for us based on the nature of our product and the volume of product that we have. Um, yeah, for us, for Overdrive, we offer options. So uh, it's a marketplace in that depending on what the content provider is okay with and then, of course, what the end user wants, there could be a variety of models that include some of the ones you mentioned. So it's not necessarily um, an A or B. It's here's the list. How do you want it? 
if a content provider says yes, good for you, and you know, you, you have that choice. The other question. I know there were a couple of other hands up there. I had one for Patty. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. I'll think of one. How do you, or you know, those in your company keep track of emerging trends and then pull the trigger to decide, yeah, we should do a subgenre of, of greeting cards around this? Like, I feel like when I go to Target, I see you know, a small little section with one or two cards on when mustaches were big as an example or something like that. Like, what's the critical mass? We heard about how it's a million dollars to develop a new artist, but you know, you got your feelers out, then you say, okay, let's pull the trigger, let's go to print with this niche so um they american greetings is is much like the fashion industry or um other consumer products industries where they uh they follow trend we have an entire trend group and not only do they just focus on content like what's sort of what's out there and what's alive and what what are people talking about but colors right they they pay attention to like what pantone is 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 espousing for the next year as their new color. And so then the color palette for, for each season, each occasion, will follow some variation or gradation of that particular color. Um, but we have an entire team devoted to trend analysis and they come back with their recommendations. It goes through the product development process. And um, un unfortunately, our product development process is a little bit long, so sometimes we can be a little bit stale, but they do have fast track. Mm -hmm and different brands. So um, American Greetings acquired Recycle Paper Greetings back in 2009 and Papyrus. And the reason why we did that was because we wanted to have a, a, a very a, a robust uh, portfolio of brands and content that could fit all these different types of trends. So what's, what's happening in the humor space with RPG, that's where we rely on that brand to capture um, those consumers. Papyrus is, is high end, it's premium, it's beautiful, Beautiful. Um, the consumer is not going online to buy cards. They're going into a papyrus uh, store and they want a, a heavy paper stock. They want a beautiful card that um, has gems and all the bling on it. Um, and so it's just done by research product development and then we market it. In a, in a strategic way across the platforms that fit with those brands. So we have um, a, a brand construct for each of the different segments of the business um, that have those motivations. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Yeah. I have a question. Uh, sorry, Patty, you're doing a lot of questions. But, That's um, okay. So, do you guys have cards that have the song clips in them too? Yes. And do you have to get um, a sound recording license for that? So, it depends. Um, Mark could help us out here too, but typically we, we do a variety of things. So we go out and we'll secure the publishing rights, and then we might do a cover of the song internally with our sound recording, our studio, um, depending on what it is. Um, other, uh, at other times, you just can't beat the sound recording, and you can't just, you can't replicate what's out there. And so we go full out and get all the different pieces and parts of the music licensing that we need for that particular card. Should not be copyrighted. Show that we have a whole episode about you know Prince saying happy birthday on up you know while, while they're actually on the air. It sounds like Seinfeld, but I don't really know. Very similar. Mm -hmm. No, I, I mean it doesn't matter how popular something is. There are people who say that when something is so popular, it just inevitably becomes part of the culture and should be free. But that's not how copyright works. But it's not the music that's copyrighted; it's the lyrics. Right. right. So yeah, we 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 license from Warner Chapel. <laughs> We're kind of seeing um, 
move in both directions, if that makes sense. Uh, uh, pe we thought that people would want would get rid of the paper entirely. You know, they just read everything online, and that's fine. But we've seen amazing growth in the last two years for people who download the paper every day onto their iPad. So they get the paper on their iPad and flip through it as if it was newsprint. And I think a lot of people like that because it, it's, it's a model that they're used to. They're used to seeing things in the same place and they like the departments, you know, they, they like that the comics are here and that the sports comes later and they're, they're used to that. What we're seeing the growth in per story is on the phone. We've seen people just want, they just want the headlines on their phone and there's an amazing growth towards that um, on the phone, like a single article uh, model there. The, the thing that's going down is the going to newsday.com or ohio.com and reading the whole website uh, to get your news that way. That's really not happening anymore. So on the on the card side itself, content with the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of content, we do not necessarily police if it comes to our attention. It typically is either a competitor, uh, like a hallmark, um, that 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 uses the content. And so on the greeting card side, it's we really don't have an infringement issue. We just don't we 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 don't where we see it is in our character programs. So for Strawberry Shortcake, Holly Hobby, um, Care Bears, we have huge copyright infringement issues. Um, and typically, those are coming out of China. So they're counterfeiters. So but you would think with e-cards that people would cut and paste. But I think, I mean, for whatever reason, it's not, we, we haven't seen a lot of issues in that space on the copyright side. A few here and there that people make us aware of, but it's that is definitely doesn't take up a, a bulk of my day worrying about. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> Pardon me. Forcing. Um, for on the character property side, oh, extremely engaged. So we have probably 60 to 70 cases pending internationally for either brand infractions or copyright, copyright infringement actions. Um, uh, we utilize copyright, uh, which I don't know, uh, and from even on a branding side, we utilize our copyrights because they provide a basis for just telling a story about the nature of who we are and what's important to us. So uh, on brands, if you're enforcing something in China, you, you may not be able to meet certain thresholds, whether it's for fame or for confusion. But if you have a copyright and you have it registered and you can show them that we've been using this copyright since 1970 and this is our, you know, you can tell a very good story. So it's, it's helpful in that way. It may be more of a social norm type of enforcement versus a versus a formal legal type of enforcement mechanism, but it's been helpful to us. So we utilize copyrights all the time. Erica, with overdrive, I mean, you're primarily a distributor. So do you spend a lot of time enforcing copyrights or do you rely on uh, the content providers? Well, um, combination of both because for, again, a comfort level to have the best content available, part of the ecosystem is using things like digital rights management to attach a lending period to the content and also to respect the one at a time use model. So in that sense, we're participating in the you know protection of it. And um, we do occasionally get requests to, you know, take down notices to remove material, and we respond to them in a timely manner. And I think that's kind of not a, that's just part of the digital landscape that 
our publishers are policing the P2P sites and seeing where the material is being sourced from. And it's usually not an overdrive sourced item, um, but rather they're just doing a kind of blanket review of what's out there. And it's in our best interest to just respond and you know take care of it quickly. Um, but the market we service is really um, librarians in particular have a very high respect for intellectual property and the protection of it. And so they're great participants in this whole ecosystem in that, of course, they're trying to provide more access at you know, flexible use terms, but we wouldn't have the content but for some rules of the road. And so it's all, um, I feel like the music industry, that tension was greater and there's always you know, advocates on one side or the other, but libraries, schools, librarians, they kind of get where we're coming from. So um, they, they've been good partners and we're, you know, we want to keep the premium content coming. So there's rules. Any other questions? Well, I'd like to please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs> Mark, I can turn it back over to you. Okay. Uh, well, that would be the uh, conclusion of the program. Then I think we can. Uh, the panel, if you, if, uh, so we are honest with our CLE. I mean, um, some of you may have questions that you would prefer to ask individually. So we've got another ten minutes. So feel free to. Yeah. We'll, we'll ask Mark. <laughs> that was the that was the legal light seminar. <laughs>